say welcome everybody to one of the Eurogen uh, educational webinar program series. Um, Eurogen is the European reference network for rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. And it's one of 24 ERNs that was set up uh, by the European Commission in 2017. And it's essentially a virtual network connected by a dedicated IT platform that allows uh, uh, the network to share medical information in a safe and secure way about a patient's case. And the reason we're doing this is so that um, the experts in our network uh, can share advice across Europe. Um, any healthcare professional from any uh, European Union member state can ask for the network's advice on rare or complex conditions. Um, and we welcome you to do that. Please feel free to contact us and the contact details for Eurogen will be available at the end of the webinar. So that's a bit about what Eurogen does. And one of our experts is Frank van der Aar, um, who we're really delighted to have here with us today. Um, he's adjunct head of clinic in the Department of Urology in University Hospitals Leuven. He's also a staff member of the National MS Centre in Melsbrook, both in Belgium. Uh, he's a lecturer at the Catholic uh, University of Leuven and his clinical expertise is in neurourology, uh, male and female incontinence and reconstructive surgery. And he's got many research interests, some in animal models of stress urinary incontinence and interstitial cells. Um, so without further ado, um, we'd like to welcome Frank and thank him for being a very active member of the network and for putting the time and effort in to share his knowledge um, with other clinicians across Europe. So thank you very much, Frank. So thank you, Michelle, for this uh, introduction. I'm going to put my slides on. So I hope my slides are clear and that you can see me. Um, I reckon it's not so easy to introduce me with all these Flemish uh, words. So thank you for this introduction. Um, so on behalf of the Eurogen network, I'm sorry, I lost my slides. On behalf of the Eurogen network, I will be talking this evening about uh, complex female incontinence or uh, the diagnosis to treatment in complex cases. Um, these are my disclosures. So I'm advisor and proctor for Coloplast, mainly with regards to the Altis link, so female incontinence. I have advised Promedon in a few uh, sessions also on female incontinence. Um, products and I'm also advisor and mainly proctor for Boston Scientific uh, on ma mainly male incontinence products but also the AMS 800 for females. We're going to talk about stress urinary incontinence today focused on the females and focused on more complex cases and also focused on the surgical side of the treatment. Um, and with this, we will have enough uh, stuff to talk about for more than half an hour. Before we start, I, I would like to set the scene a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to have a clinical, practical sound approach, uh, mainly because I think this is the only relevant approach that we can have uh, with regards to these subjects. Uh, we know that in this uh, area of medicine. Unfortunately, we do not have the luxury to have solid evidence. So most of the things I will be saying today are based on expert opinions, uh, institutional habits. So it depends on the place where you live and where you're trained, how you will solve the problems. And the majority of the knowledge that we have gained comes from observational studies. So certainly when we start comparing different treatment strategies, I'm afraid that the level of evidence of the things that we are saying is rather limited. Nevertheless, we do have long-standing experience with the most uh, techniques that we use, so we do know quite a lot about results and about safety profile. This is based on the setting where I work and where I live, and this is an 
large academic center, tertiary center, localized in the, in the center of, of uh, Europe, in Leuven, uh, Belgium, uh, and Europe. So, meaning that we have access to specific treatments, but not all treatments that we could give to these patients are reimbursed, and that's why some of the habits that you will use in your center of some of the things that you will see in your region uh, will not be mentioned here today, but if you have any comments or additions, uh, feel free to remark on that, and we can discuss uh, about these different treatment strategies after my lecture. Uh, the lecture is part of the Eurogen lectures. Uh, Eurogen is uh, the reference network, as Michel said, for rare urogenital disorders, and it consists of three work streams. Um, we will be talking today in uh, the aspect of work stream two, which deals with uh, functional urogenital conditions that require highly specialized surgery. And when we look into the work stream, we will be mainly talking about the first three disease areas, uh, meaning complicated and complex pelvic floor disorders, um, diseases and conditions affecting the female urethra, and then urethral reconstruction. Because as we will see and we will talk about the complex cases, this means that most of the time uh, the patients have already undergone some kind of surgery or had some kind of a congenital disorder that makes uh, the disease complex. So complex female incontinence. Uh, first, we will talk a little bit uh, of the word complex. Uh, when is female incontinence complex? And I think uh, maybe not linear, but risingly complex when it is recurrent, when the patient had surgery before, was dry, but became incontinent again after the surgery. If the patient was stress incontinent, underwent some kind of a surgical treatment, but the treatment failed from the first step, then we talk about persistent incontinence, or when the patient had a successful sling surgery, for example, with a mesh, with a mid urethral tape, but there was a complication uh, due to the mesh uh, problems, which was solved most of the time by excision. And then after that, the patient became incontinent again. And this is a portion of the pathology that we will see today. And obviously, when the patient underwent previous pelvic surgery or was irradiated, which changes the tissue aspect uh, of the pelvis and which also changes the, uh, the behavior of the tissue. So this renders the surgery for incontinence uh, more difficult and probably will also diminish the results or could have effect on other organs such as the bladder. So we might uh, question the indication for stress incontinence surgery. And the same is true for several underlying conditions like the neurourological issues or uh, lifelong congenital disorders that still have their effect when we want to treat uh, stress urinary incontinence uh, in the adults. So I will run through the majority of these uh, clinical aspects uh, during the presentation, and we will come back on several of these elements. The first thing that is very important, uh, and I think is very logical as well, is that when we are going to treat patients uh, with complex underlying disorders or with a history of previous surgery, uh, in that area, we always do a full multimodal assessment of this patient. These are not the patients that are studied in the value trial of the New England Journal, Journal of Medicine, uh, which consists of the primary surgery for uh, simple urinary incontinence with no other pathologies, but on the contrary, these patients have a lot of comorbidities or pitfalls that we will have to find out before we embark on surgical treatment. So obviously we need a thorough history and clinical examination. We will ask to keep a micturition diary to evaluate bladder function. And I think that is probably mandatory to perform cystoscopy uh, 
a neurodynamic study in all these cases in order to be sure that we do not miss some aspects uh, of underlying problems um, that we could not resolve or that we cannot resolve by performing stress urinary incontinence surgery. And then in selected cases, so I don't think this is always mandatory, but in selected cases, we will do additional imaging uh, for workout in these patients. And I have a few examples and all the examples uh, that I will show you today uh, are pulled out my own clinical practice. And these are all pictures or, or uh, photographs and then and, and, um, X-rays that I took from my own patient practice. We have to be critical. I think it's very important in the complex setting that we have to be satisfied with the findings that we uh, make. Uh, we have to answer the question why the patient is here and uh, whether the findings that we have on these investigations are an answer to the reason why the patient is here and can they cause the problem uh, the patient is searching a solution for. This is one of the examples. Uh, imagine this is a close-up of a scarred vagina for a patient that underwent previous surgery. And at first look, the patient complains of stress urinary incontinence because there is occasional leak. But if you do a thorough history, the patient actually has continuous incontinence. And it's not only when the patient is coughing or sneezing, but also when she's changing position. And so if you take the effort to do a thorough clinical examination and you fill the bladder with methylene blue, you see that on the left-hand side of the patient, there is a dimple in the scar that shows some methylene blue. And probably here as well, on the upper side, there is a small fistula. So if we would treat this patient with another sling surgery or with an autologous fascia sling, the patient will not be happy. The same is true for this patient. In these patients, we perform uh, clinical examination under sedation. And this patient had a previous sling removed and had recurrent stress urinary incontinence. But before we started the surgery, we did a thorough examination with methylene blue again. And you can see that here we have put a very small uh, catheter inside a fistula between the bladder and the vagina. So here again, if we just uh, place a sling or a new, new treatment to treat the stress urinary incontinence, we will not solve the problem of the patient. So we have to uh, be as sure as possible that we can be about the uh, diagnosis that we make. This is a small movie of a clinical examination under uh, sedation. And you can see that we put uh, Hega stift into the urethra, and this patient has an obstructive sling located at the bladder neck. Um, this patient had a sling before and had persistent incontinence because the sling is not nicely positioned mid urethrally but is located too proximal, and also complained of straining and positioning in order to empty the bladder. So, if you do a thorough clinical examination, you can see that the sling is wrongly positioned and this patient needed a transection of the first sling and a positioning of a second sling in the normal mid uh, position in order to solve her problem. Um, I am quite keen on doing cystoscopy in this patient group because they had previous surgery often or they have underlying conditions. Um, and unfortunately, a reasonable proportion of the patients had previous sling surgery, which did not solve their problem. And these four pictures are all different patients that uh, visit my outpatient clinic with a problem of recurrent stress urinary incontinence. They attended their primary treating physician, which the majority of cases, no pun intended, was a gynecologist. And they were told to go home because nothing was wrong. When you do a thorough history in these patients, they all complain of pain during micturition, stabbing pain in the urethra. And already by history, I can assume what is the problem. 
But if you put in a cystoscope and you go blindly through the urethra and you just look around into the bladder, you won't see any problems. So it's very important to also perform a urethroscopy. And while entering the urethra or while going back outside of the bladder, uh, you will see in these cases that you have a big chance to see uh, some mesh tissue that is extruded into the urethra. And so by having this diagnosis, you know that we can solve the problem by removing this mesh and probably in a second phase, uh, putting some new autologous fascia to solve the recurrent stress urinary incontinence in these cases. I also um, am keen on performing urodynamic study in these populations. Certainly when there are underlying conditions like neurological disorders or when the patients underwent previous pelvic surgery or had irradiation. So this patient, uh, I think the, the figures are too small to read on your screens, but I can tell you that this patient starts leaking at approximately 400 milliliters of bladder filling. And when you have a history of these patients, it might seem that this patient suffers from stress urinary incontinence. But if you look at these pressures in the bladder, you see that there is a compliance problem and that the bladder is filled from, from the moment the bladder is filled with 100 milliliters of saline, the pressure starts rising gradually. And you see that at the moment when the patient reaches 400 milliliters, uh, the pressure is already above 50 centimeters of uh, water pressure. So that's when the patient starts leaking. So again here, we probably want to solve this compliance disorder before we embark on some kind of stress urinary incontinence surgery, because that will not solve the problem. This is another example of urodynamic investigation that will change our diagnosis. Uh, here you see a very minimal bladder filling and on 30 or 40 milliliters filling, um, the patient undergoes uh, a heavy contraction of the detrusor muscle. So we see that there is a, a severe form of detrusor overactivity with leakage of urine with pressures of approximately 100 centimeters of water. So again, if you embark on stress urinary incontinence surgery, in this case, uh, you will probably not be successful. So, urodynamic investigation can learn us some about some things about bladder condition. In selected cases, we will perform additional imaging. This patient is a patient that underwent hysterectomy uh, some weeks or months before the evaluation at our office. And because of, again, uh, incontinence, we performed a cystography, and this is the same picture, but I made some nice uh, colorings uh, to make it easy. And you see the orange part is the bladder. Then if you look well, I hope it's uh, clear for you at home, you can see a, a narrow fistula trajectory. And then the yellow part on the right-hand slide is the vagina that also has uh, some contrast uh, inside. So this is a nice example of a vesicovaginal fistula that we can demonstrate by uh, performing, uh, by doing um, uh, cystography. Obviously, we already thought about this problem when we took the history of the patient and we might uh, probably demonstrate this by using the methylene blue examination that I showed you before. This is more difficult. This is a similar patient uh, that underwent a hysterectomy a few weeks or months before uh, she visited our outpatient clinic. Um, and when we did a clinical examination, we did not see any methylene blue coming into the vagina. When we performed uh, X-ray cystography, we did not see any leakage uh, into the vagina again but still the patient uh, persisted and insisted that there was a continuous leak of urine into the vagina. So we have performed uh, intravenous uh, urography or a CT IVU. And here you can see that the uh, 
right ureter of the patient uh, continues into some kind of amorph coloring of the vagina. So in this case, uh, we have diagnosed a urethrovaginal fistula. And so this goes to show that, as I told you before, uh, we have to be critical and we have to be happy with the findings that we have. And I think before we continue uh, to treat these patients, these complex patients, we need to have a diagnosis. And I think if you look at the list I present here, uh, you will probably catch the vast majority of patients in this complex space with this uh, small number of diagnoses. And so, Luckily, we'll also find patients that just have recurrent or persistent stress urinary incontinence or even primary stress urinary incontinence, but with underlying conditions or underlying history. But we have to bear in mind that a lot of these patients will also have urgency or a mixed form of incontinence. And that we have to try to find out which of the two is the most dominant form of incontinence and which of the ones uh, bothers the patients most so that we, we can start treating the most bothersome complaint first. Um, in a reasonable amount of uh, patients, we will find mesh issues, exposure and uh, extruding into some parts of the body. And obviously, we will have to uh, deal with that problem prior to solving the recurrent incontinence or we might induce uh, recurrent incontinence by treating these issues. If there is some previous surgery for stress urinary incontinence in the history, we will have to determine whether we have to do something about the previous surgery. And this will mainly be the case when there is also obstruction part of the symptom complex, as I showed with the movie of the obstructive sling that was located at the bladder neck. We will find a reasonable number of fistulae and especially with fistulae we need to have a high index of suspicion and especially because the majority of fistulae you can find by just performing a good clinical examination and I think you need to have a low threshold to asking your nurse to get some methylene blue uh, and putting the methylene blue with a catheter uh, in the outpatient clinic and uh, taking five extra minutes to wait and investigate whether you see some blue appearing in the vagina. And then obviously we should bear in mind, certainly when we have urgency or mixed urinary incontinence, that we can have some severe bladder disorders. Certainly when there is uh, underlying neurological disease or when the patient underwent previous uh, irradiation, uh, because we will find some compliance disorders or overactive detrusor as I showed in the urodynamic studies. And obviously, we want to tackle the bladder problems first before we embark on surgery at the level of the urethra. And not to forget, uh, all of these patients, certainly when they had previous uh, surgery, uh, can have associated pain problems and or sexual problems that at least need to be addressed. Um, it's hard to solve all these problems and uh, often, unfortunately, we have to tell the patients that some of these issues are there and the surgery that we are envisaging, uh, that we are that we are planning, uh, will not always solve that problems, uh, but at least I think we should address the clinical problem and talk about it with our patients. So, make sure you have a working diagnosis and when you have a diagnosis, you can start making a treatment plan and discussing discussing the uh, the pros and cons of the treatment that you uh, foresee with the patient. Uh, in general, if we have recurrent incontinence or persisting incontinence, no matter, no matter what is the history of the patient, uh, we can blame this uh, at several levels. We can say there is a problem with the sling, there was a problem with the surgeon, or there is a problem with the patient. And we can discuss whether the patient problem actually is a surgeon problem, uh, but nevertheless. Uh, sling problems, I think the majority that we will encounter today is that we will see a number of complications from synthetic slings. I still like to implant synthetic slings. I think they're a good solution for stress urinary incontinence, but due to the high number of slings, the 
relative low number of complications that exists does result in a reasonable number of absolute cases. I don't think there is many biological slings on the market today, but I have no doubt that uh, some new designs will come on the market, certainly in the current era, where uh, there's a lot of problems uh, really are perceived with synthetic slings and mesh materials. So I think we should be cautious and we had some bad experience with biological slings in the past, certainly on the long run. So we should bear in mind that uh, this might be a cause of recurrent incontinence. There might be a technical surgical issue and I showed it nicely in the, in the movie. Uh, we had the problems in that movie, both of tensioning and positioning. If the sling is not well positioned at the mid urethra, but higher up at the bladder neck, it might not serve its goal and patients might just be persisting incontinent. Um, it has been described that some of the slings, be it autologous fascia slings or uh, synthetic slings might migrate a little bit, certainly when the dissection of the surgeon was quite broad. And so that can also result in malpositioning of the sling. And then tensioning, we can over tension or under tension slings, which might also result in or uh, recurrent incontinence or persisting incontinence or uh, recurrent stress incontinence or urgency and urgency incontinence. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong here. The patient uh, themselves, obesity has been uh, proposed as a risk factor, but on the other hand, a lot of publications also show that obesity probably is not so important. Um, what's more important and more uh, to argue about or to, to discuss uh, in this, uh, in this uh, space is the fact that some of the patients uh, can have what is called in some, uh, uh, some areas intrinsic sphincter deficiency. I like to call this low urethral close, closure pressure or fixed urethra, the absence of urethral mobility. And this is a difficult patient group to tackle but I will come back to that later. If we have these complex patients, what are the tools that we have uh, to treat them? Uh, I made a list that's probably not exhaustive, but we can use new synthetic slings and there is different designs. We can use facial slings, autologous slings. We can use bulking agents, ACT balloons, and the artificial urinary sphincter. I will mainly talk about these three solutions because these are the ones that we use and because in, in my hospital, in my country, nor bulking agents, nor ACT balloons are reimbursed and so I don't have any experience with these uh, agents or materials. A re repeat meteorite sling or a, re uh, a second sling. It can work and this is just by example, this is one of the publications that happens to be from our center. We just uh, retrospectively analyzed the repeat slings that we performed in approximately 80 patients. We had a follow-up of uh, more than three years at median time and we have shown in this uh, observational study that a lot of these patients fare well and we were not the only ones. Uh, there is more than uh, more, there's more um, uh, series that published uh, uh, more than 20 patients in different series and so there is a reasonable amount of data. If you look at the design of the study as I anticipated in the beginning of the lecture, these are all observational studies so I think uh, although the authors sometimes give messages that the one route or the one technique is better than another, I think we should uh, be cautious with these conclusions because if you have observational data, obvious, obviously there will be a huge selection bias and it's hard to prove this. And we should actually have a randomized control trial to prove this. And maybe this is something where the Eurogen could be instrumental in this uh, complex group in the future it would be very nice. Anyway, why would we perform a second sling? And there are many reasons and I, I've listed four reasons that I find why we should consider doing a second sling. First of all, because it is easy. It is the easiest solution from the entire list that I uh, produced uh, previous slides, uh, one of the previous slides. Uh, we're used to doing this. Uh, we put in a lot of slings uh, 
And this is proven in the fact that all these observational series have shown that the patients do not stay in the hospital for a long time. Actually, they don't have more blood loss, they don't have longer surgery times or hospital stays than uh, with a primary implant. Secondly, the majority of these series do report good results. And although I do not agree with uh, authors that claim that they can say that one treatment is better than another, I do think that observational studies give us some ideas about the effect and the adverse events of these treatments. And we see that, for example, in our series, the median PET use went from three PETs to zero, meaning that at least half of our patients were dry uh, and probably a little bit more. And that the vast majority of these patients, when we asked them, said that they were satisfied with the treatment. So we have improved the life of the majority of these patients. We did see some complications and the two most prevalent complications were de novo urgency with or without incontinence and residual urine. The majority of these complications were mild, acceptable in occurrence and were treatable. For example, in our series of 80 patients, we had 11 patients that presented with high post void residual. Uh, five of them had only temporary catheterization and went on voiding spontaneously after uh, transurethral catheter for a few days. Uh, the other ones started on clean intermittent self catheterization, and only three of them remained on clean intermittent self catheterization for a longer period. Um, two of them accepted the situation and did not want to have the risk to become wet again, so they remained on clean intermittent self catheterization and were dry. And one went on to have further surgery with release and things like that. And then the last argument is that it is the most frequently performed surgery after a failed primary surgery. And this was shown by Hashim Hashim a few years ago in the United Kingdom. So I'm not sure if this still holds true today with uh, the mesh story, but anyway, this was the case a few years ago. Um, when we want to treat these patients, I'm gonna reiterate a little bit. Obviously we have to know what happened before, what kind of a uh, surgery has been performed. And in my case, it will be the vast majority of the patients will have had previous link surgery. I think it's very important to do a clinical examination where you specifically address the issue of the residual urethral mobility. If you have a fixed urethra, uh, the solution will be more difficult and we will talk about that later. It's hard to discuss about the prevalence of a fixed urethra. If you look at the published series the, that I mentioned, uh, the prevalence or the incidence of fixed urethra in that series varies between zero and 31%, but this reflects the, the selection bias and the, the specific population that these authors examined because in some of these series, a mobile urethra was an inclusion criterion. So I don't think we can say anything about the real prevalence of a fixed urethra. Uh, in the recurrent or persistent or complex incontinent female patients. And we can argue about the necessity of performing uh, pressure recordings of the urethra. Do we have to record for salva leak point pressures or mean urethral closing pressures? Um, it's arguable, there is some variability, uh, but if it is mentioned in literature, uh, these are the values that are most of the time used, so less than 60 centimeters waters for a Vassalva leak point pressure and approximately less than 20 centimeter water for the mean urethral closing pressure. And again, in the uh, mentioned literature, this is present in 10 to 100 percent because again, this is more a reflection of the selection criteria than of the real prevalence in the population. Um, I think that in real life, only a small subgroup of failed sling patients will have fixed urethra or intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Um, I think it's important to realize that in this population, we will probably not be able to solve uh, their problem physiologically with sling surgery, because if we want to use slings to solve their incontinence, we will by definition have to obstruct them. And so we will construct a non-physiological state with obstructive avoiding or even retention. And so this will result uh, on higher rates of voiding dysfunction and overactive bladder problems. Uh, 
uh, again I have some uh, caution by using these figures but it has been published uh, there is some weak evidence that retropubic uh, roots do a little bit better uh, and that cure rates for adjustable designs might be relatively high in these specific subpopulations where the authors did the effort to measure the closing pressure and define intrinsic sphincter deficiency or where they did a clinical examination and uh, selected fixed urethras or both of them. The guidelines are not very instructive uh, uh, as expected because I already told you in the beginning that there is not much, not, not much literature uh, besides observational studies and so there are some uh, recommendations and level of evidence but this is all low value. Um, so what is our clinical approach? Um, I think in these patients we can offer autologous sling or AMS 800, that's what we do. And this is a little bit, in a nutshell, the explanation I give to my patients. I advise them that when we select an autologous sling, there is no uh, foreign implant, uh, no uh, silicone, and they don't have to start using buttons or no handling, which can be quite challenging in females, certainly when they are well fed, like the majority of a little bit older uh, Flemish uh, women. But on the contrary, an autologous sling might result in obstructive voiding uh, and urgency on the longer run, and there is a reasonable risk of having to perform a CIFC, which is also not easy uh, in the same population when they're well fed uh, and they have to find the urethra. The AMS 800 on the other side uh, might uh, give them the possibility for a more physiological voiding uh, and could be probably less invasive uh, when we can offer this in a non open way, although this is not uh, proven yet. On the other hand, we do need a silicone implant and it's hydraulic, so we have a reasonable revision rate and the people need to be able to handle the pump uh, every day several times. So very quickly on the technique, uh, when we perform an autologous fascial sling, uh, we tend to harvest it from the leg. So this is a picture of the leg of a patient and after uh, making some nice drawings to find the exact location where we make the incisions, uh, we make a small incision uh, of about three centimeters at one spot. We uh, open the fat and we see the fascia lata. Uh, we incise it on both sides and cut one end. We take a non-resorbable suture and then we use a malleable retractor underneath and above the fascia to release it. And with the scissors we can uh, harvest a nice strip of fascia lata. After we have harvested this strip, uh, we clean it, we defat it, and we put it on uh, two non-absorbable uh, polypropylene sutures. And after that, uh, we are going actually like a more uh, classical TVT approach, but we release the paraurethral space and the retrospubic space a little bit more. And this is uh, a few pictures where we use uh, uh, Pereira needle, we perforate the retropubic space and we uh, uh, come out in the vagina where we uh, put in the wires uh, on both sides and so we can position the sling nicely widely above the urethra and then in the last picture we um, can fix the sling on the string on the fascia. Uh, most of the time we fill the bladder with about 300 milliliters of uh, saline with isobetadine and we check whether we have enough pressure um, to stop the leaking from the urethra. So this is actually uh, not the most complex surgery uh, but uh, it can give good solutions certainly when the patient has a little bit of residual uh, mobility left. This is all from primary setting but there is some evidence in primary setting that the overall cure rate is non-significantly different between autologous versus synthetic sling and that complication rates are a little bit higier um, in the sling in 2017 um, 
it was stated that the meteoritual sling are equivalent to the pubovaginal autologous sling in overall and subjective contents rate. And that the reason why the complication rate in the PVS was a little bit higher was because of the incidence of storage LUTs. So complication rates, uh, figures that have been reported in literature are quite high rate of de novo urgency and a reasonable rate of bladder outlet obstruction, as I said before. And certainly when we pre-select patients with a fixed urethra. After previous link excision, the results are almost the same. And you see that there is actually a very small amount of literature uh, in current literature. What about the sphincter? There's a lot of open series with reasonable numbers. In the end, we do have a reasonable number of almost a thousand patients have been reported, but all of them are, uh, except one, are retrospective cohort studies. Um, actually, in the beginning of the device, four or five implants in the first publications were women. So we always think that this is, a, this is only a male device, but actually in the beginning, it was a bisex device with the majority of implants in women. Uh, and so robotic implants is the new kid on the block and there is a l very little bit of literature um, published and, and one little bit larger series in European urology where they also explain their technique. Uh, so 49 implants uh, with a follow-up of one and a half year, which is a pre-selected group of non-irradiated um, patients, but also few, few neurogenic. So we can hardly call this the most complex group. Uh, and you see that they do have reasonable results with 40 dry, uh, which is not so bad in this case, and then uh, some intraoperative complications and some postoperative complications. Um, the majority of the intraoperative complications are injuries due to the dissection, and this is uh, the bottleneck of the procedure. Um, so when at follow-up, as you can see, 80% is dry and 12% is improved, which actually is quite a good result. But this is not the complex group that we are talking about today, so probably we should be uh, a little bit cautious with interpreting these results. Uh, there's a few steps in the dissection, and I think I might still have time to show a short, short video um, about the technique. It's about five minutes. It's uh, in a little bit fast forward, so I, because I wanted to finish this in five minutes, so I'm not such a good robotic surgeon. Um, we have done a few cases in our hospital, so we did perform a few open cases a year, about five a year, and we have shifted to robotic implant, I think approximately uh, one and a half year ago. And I was not the most experienced robotic surgeon, so I do think this is a technique that's feasible for uh, uh, people who are, have the habit to perform reconstructive and uh, anti-incontinence surgery, if you have a little bit of robotic experience. So you can go nicely into the retio space and really clean up to the endopelvic fascia until you see the bladder neck. And you see we will pull the balloon in a second and then you can identify the bladder neck. And so we will start the dissection at the lower part of the bladder neck that I'm pointing out now. Uh, the resident puts in a finger in the vagina and really pushes that area to the shoulder of the patient. And you can see the white signing, shining uh, space that is actually the inner side of the vaginal epithelium. And on the finger of the fellow or of the, the assistant, we start dissecting, uh, sliding the prograft retractor on the vaginal mucosa behind the bladder neck. We do exactly the same procedure on the other side as you will see in a second. And so by doing this maneuver on both sides, we will construct a tunnel in between the vaginal mucosa and the bladder neck. So again, on the finger uh, of the assistant, who is seated uh, in between the legs of the patient and you see the white shining tissue, which is the big advantage of this technique is that due to the pressure in the abdomen, the veins don't start bleeding and you can uh, have a visual control of the space that you're dissecting. And so you see that we can gently make a tunnel, blunt dissection, so we never try to um, 
uh, forest transit and this is something this is actually the most difficult part and it takes a few minutes to make the tunnel so this is a little bit obviously shortened down once we have made the tunnel and we think that it's wide enough we can pass the measuring tape underneath and then we will use the measuring tape uh, to check the width of the tunnel that we have made and to dissect it a little bit extra to make sure that the cuff of the sphincter device will be able to pass without too much obstruction underneath uh, the bladder neck. So here we check whether the space is wide enough and if there is a if it's as wide as the grasper and the white tape does not seem to bend too much uh, the dissection is sufficient and so we will measure the bladder neck and most often we implant seven seven and a half uh, to eight so you see this is eight but still a little bit loose so we'll go to seven and a half or seven probably and we release it and when you release this we pull the catheter once more to check if the balloon doesn't enter too much uh, into the measuring device and afterwards we use the measuring tape to lift the tissue and we pass the AMS underneath. And then you will see that it fits nicely. And as you can see, we are actually doing the surgery in a relatively small hole uh, of the peritoneum, which is actually the hole of the bladder drop. And one of the nice things, I will continue because of time constraints, is that after the surgery and you place the balloon, you can nicely close the peritoneum again and you will see that due to the pressure, it really goes back into its place and so you can really close the area and the entire device is nicely in the preperitoneal space. Uh, so to end uh, my talk, I will just go through the algorithm uh, that we use in our hospital to tackle these complex patients. I think if we do history of stress urinary incontinence after failed conservative treatment without associated symptoms, without interfering comorbidities or without previous surgical treatment, uh, we will just do a clinical exam, a stress test and a post void residual and we will offer them uh, these slings in our institution. If the patient, however, has associated symptoms, interfering comorbidities or previous sur surgical treatments, we will also do, as I stated before, additional investigations. But in the end, if they still have a normal hypermobile urethra, we will still offer sling surgery. If, on the other hand, the patient has um, more complex situation, if there is residual hypermobility, we will go for transobturator slings or retropubic slings. And if the patient is severely incontinent, um, has no residual urethral mobility, which we then call the fixed urethra or intrinsic sphincter deficiency, we will go for these last two results. So we will offer, after thorough explanation, a pubo vaginal sling or an artificial urinary sphincter depending on uh, the patient's uh, talk or the talk with the patient and the outpatient clinic. Uh, so with this fast last algorithm, I think my time uh, is over and I will ask Darren or anyone if there is a question or... Yeah, thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, we've got a bit of time for some questions, hopefully. So one question came through during the presentation, so I'll send that on to you immediately. Um, hopefully you'll see it. In a second. You got it? Um, I'm checking, yes. I only see part of the question. How do you diagnose obstruction in women based on your dynamics? Do you routinely use the Solomon Greenwell nomogram for bladder owl obstruction in women, or do you use a different one? I think that's a really good question. Um, personally, uh, 
will say in our institution, institutionally, we do not really use nomograms. Uh, I think uh, it's hard to use nomograms because all of them are flawed in, in a certain way. Um, actually, we really use clinical uh, diagnosis. So I think uh, thorough history, uh, clinical examination, uh, flowmetry, and just the story of the patient tells us they have to position, they have to strain, then we have a diagnosis of obstruction. I do think you can use nomograms uh, within one center. If your center is really used to doing pressure recordings, you have always the same persons and the same material material uh, to use or to do the urodynamics, then you can use this in your algorithm. But I think it's very hard to compare this uh, between different centers. So personally, um, I don't really have a good place for, for nomograms. Although I do recognize that a lot of these nomograms can have their, their specific place. So I hope, I hope that's, uh, that satisfies you uh, as, a, as an answer to your question. We should have another question there, Frank, I think, as well. Yeah, another question. Uh, what do you think about spiral sling uh, in case uh, of recurrent refractory stress urine incontinence? Uh, well, yes, um, as I told you, the, the practice I, I talked about or the practice that we have in our institution, and I'm, I'm well aware that there are different possibilities, different techniques. I think the spiral sling is designed to make it uh, even more obstructive. So I think you probably can, um, can make patients dry even more satisfactory but i also think that this is an obstructive sling and the philosophy of that sling is not really different uh, as to the philosophy of any other autologous sling so i think you still have to counsel your patients for possible uh, overactive bladder and urgency issues and emptying issues uh, high pvr or need for self-catheterization Okay, um, we want the other questions at If people want to uh, type something in now, I'll say if people um, think of something afterwards and can't think of anything immediately, um, please, um, you'll have my contact, contact details um, and you can send any other questions onto that and I'll pass them on uh, to Frank. Uh, also, I should say, I'll be, this whole webinar is recorded, so we'll be sending the link out tomorrow as well, or, or, or this week at least, sorry, um, to everyone so you can access on our go-to webinar. Uh, platform. You'll also be able to access it on our new YouTube channel, uh, which has also got some of the past webinars on um, as well. We'll be adding some more to that in the next week or so, so please do check that out. Um, if you haven't done so, please check out our, the Eurogen website. Um, you can find lots of information on there. There'll be uh, links and information to all the past webinars as well on there, as well as future ones that are coming up and the dates and presenters and titles. Um, you also um find all links to social media on there if you want to follow us as well um so uh, if you want to keep in touch with everything's going on we'll be advertising the webinars on, on those platforms uh, going forward um so yeah i think uh no other questions at the moment so <laughs> let's give people a couple more seconds it's not so it's still a minute to six so let's uh, make it a full hour and then um yeah we can uh, sign off Okay, so I, I, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and I hope that um, it was all clear and understandable. Yeah, yeah I think it was, was for me, um, as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, one thing I will say, we'll, you'll get a, a reminder follow-up email um, tomorrow, those who have attended. We've added a survey onto that, so it'd be really grateful if you could fill that in. It's got some questions around how was the sound, things like that, and was everything clear? and some questions about um, Eurogen as well and just you know, more general questions as well. So anybody could fill that in, that would be much appreciated to give us some feedback on how things are going and how we can improve going forward. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, thank you to everyone for attending. And thank you very much, Frank, for presenting. It was very good. And um, okay. we'll uh, be in, kind of keep you in touch with what's going on through our website and social media in terms of future presentations. So I'm going to end the webinar now, but thank you all very much.